All right, Alexander, let's talk about the uh, Russian economy. And uh, we have to focus in on the Russian economy because we had some statements from uh, the central bank uh, chief. I guess you would call her the chief, the head of the central bank, Elvira Nabulina. A controversial person, I would say, but I think she's doing an excellent job handling everything. But she did come out with some warnings during her statements about the... Uh, the phase, this next phase that the Russian economy is about to enter into. And you also had yesterday, you had uh, some statements from Russian President Putin. He was uh, having a meeting with regards to, to domestic issues, pretty much. But he came out with an interesting statement saying that the economic blitzkrieg against Russia had failed. Um, he also mentioned that he's going to be increasing the payroll of uh, of public workers. He said he's going to be putting in programs to help entrepreneurs, especially dealing with, uh, with the sanctions and the currency restrictions. But in essence, I, I think Elvira Nabolina gave a little bit more of, I don't want to say pessimistic, but more of a cautious um, statement. While Putin definitely wasn't optimistic, he gave a little bit of a, of a more bright, a brighter, a little more positive. So I guess you could say a little bit of good cop, bad cop in a way, but uh, where, where do you think the Russian economy lies on, on these uh, two spectrums? I, I, I think that the two comments were complementary. And by the way, and I can't absolutely confirm this, but I think that they were made over the course of the same meeting. I think what happened was that there was a meeting on economic issues in the Kremlin, and they were, you know, doing some forward planning and looking at the situation and reviewing what to do. Putin made his introductory comments, which is the ones that we, you know, have attributing to him. Then he invited Nabulina as the first person to speak. She then spoke and set out her views, and then others were invited to do so. And at that point, at the end of it, Putin as he always does, did a summing up. And I think what we have as Nabulina's statement is, in fact, the statement that she gave to this meeting. Now, I say that I'm not absolutely sure that that is right, but, but that is what I think basically happened. Now, it is the job of the governor of a central bank to be cautious. I think that's the first thing to say. If a government of a central bank is over-optimistic, if he or she is telling us that all is well, that we can just go on cutting interest rates, pumping out money, doing all the kind of things that we want to do. Uh, what a former head of the Fed once said was, you know, handing out the punch bowl at the party, you know, and canning out more and more drinks at the party. Well, a central bank governor like that is a menace. So I think some degree of caution on Nabolina's part is entirely appropriate both to her job and to the current situation. Now, where are we? Putin said that there'd been an economic blitzkrieg, a financial blitzkrieg on Russia. Now, we said it right back in February. That was economic shock and all, financial shock and all. You seize the assets of the central bank. You, uh, uh, or at least half of them, you uh, um, sanction the central bank so that it can't have, operate with contacts with other central banks. Um, the expectation was, and this is indisputable because the briefing notes are all there, they're still up there on the White House website, that that would mean that the central bank would not be able to support the ruble. The ruble would then go into free fall. That was what was said. Um, um, Biden subsequently talked about it, you know, falling, to, you know, become the ruble becoming rubble, 200 to the dollar. One ruble, 200 rubles to the dollar, all that sort of thing. And of course, it didn't turn out that way at all. And the reason it didn't turn out that way at all is because Nabolina did her job as governor of the central bank and prevented it from happening. She raised interest rates. I know this is controversial with some people, but I think as an emergency reaction, that was absolutely the correct thing to do. She provided the necessary liquidity to the financial system. She made sure that the financial system was operating properly and she held it all together. And she proved herself to be this year an extremely effective financial crisis manager. So we have a very st stable situation with the ruble. 
In fact, the problem with the ruble at the moment is that the ruble shows signs of appreciating too quickly. There is a massive amount of cash, of foreign currency, swishing around the Russian economy as uh, euros and dollars pour into Russia from Russian energy and uh, uh, energy sales. The Russians are prevented now from importing many goods. Uh, and of course, they're afraid to lead, take this money out and put it in foreign accounts, because if they do, it could easily be stolen. So all of this money is piling up in Russia. And there is a there are comments, some members of the government are saying, you know, we, we should convert it all into rubles. Others are saying if we convert it all into rubles, that will make the ruble too strong. It could go to 50, 60 rubles to the dollar, and that would not be good for the underlying competitiveness of our economy. So you have this particular problem at the moment. So she's got that problem to worry about, the fact that there's massive amounts of excess foreign currency in Russia as well. And, of course, the other problem she has is that because of the massive orchestrated pullout of Western companies from Russia, there are now gaps appearing in the Russian consumer market. There are problems in supply chains for Russian companies, and that is causing a fall in production. And that, in turn, is leading to uh, um, um, inflation, higher inflation within Russia itself. So what she's basically saying is, look, we've got to deal with these problems. We've got to increase production of goods, domestically sourced goods in Russia. We've got to find foreign uh, foreign countries that you know can complement us, but which will not join us in sanctions wars and join the West in sanctions wars. We've got to do all of these things. We've got to deal with these supply problems, these problems in the actual, the real economy. But we've got to be extremely careful because if we pile money into the economy, if we shovel money into the economy just to you know, resolve all of these problems, we risk causing inflation to rise out of control. So she is being, she's acting as a break on those people who say, we've got these problems. What we need to do is to spend more money to sort them out. Now, Russia isn't just a wash with foreign currency. It's also a wash with money generally, because as a result of the fact that Russia is not importing goods, um, there is a massive trade surplus. The government is currently running an enormous budget surplus. It has an enormous amount of money to spend. And what Putin was saying to Navalina is, look, I understand all you're saying, but you've got to find some means of supporting the economy. It's ludicrous to just save all this money and keep it in the bank. If you like, we've got to spend some of it to support the economy. And what I want you to do is to work together with the finance minister, the economics minister, and other people like that to find means to, say, to, sp to spend this money to support the economy, make life less difficult for people until this transition of where we get our own domestic supply chains organized until that period is um, over. So the Russians are having these debates, they're having these meetings, they're doing some degree of forward planning. We see very capable people like Labulina and Beluzov, the economics advisor, and uh, um, other people. They're having each, and Siluanov, the finance minister, are talking about what to do. And, you know, one can agree or disagree with some of the things that they're saying, but at least they are addressing these problems. What comparable what is happening which is comparable to that anywhere in the West? Yeah, well, let's get to that. Not this segment. Let's get to that in the next segment. Explain yeah, what they're doing in the West yeah. then. But yeah. the one question that I have is, yeah. how do you explain uh, Nabulina's statement then where she said that um, she essentially gave a warning about Russia's uh, reserves, far, yeah. not foreign reserves, overall reserves. And she said yes. that uh, Russia 
has had their reserves cut in half by the theft that took place of, uh, of their uh, foreign reserves that were sitting outside of Russia. And she gave a warning. She said, these reserves, while it's a lot, it's, it's plenty, it's not enough to carry the economy through any difficulties. How do you explain that warning? Well, that's entirely correct. I mean, that has to be correct. I mean, uh, uh, you don't want to spend your reserves um, in that kind of way. You don't need, you don't spend reserves I, because this is where the pressure the pressure is coming, as I said, to actually embark on a massive spending program. So what she's saying is, if you do that, you risk much higher domestic inflation, and you also risk frittering away our, our you know our, our our fund, our emergency fund, on what might turn out to be malinvestments. So what you've got to do is you've got to actually carry out you know, proper solutions, organizational solutions, because that's the way that you're going to keep bring the economy through. So she's being absolutely, as I said, she's being conservative. She's being proper. I'm sure she'll be heeded. That doesn't mean that she won't you know, come up against some pressure from others who say, look, we've got to increase spending to some extent, even though that means dipping into our reserves. Because, you know, we need to do that in order to smooth over this period of transition. So she's absolutely right. She's saying, you know, this isn't a situation where we can just live indefinitely off reserves, however big they are. We have got to make those changes within the real economy, set up those supply cha- those alternative supply chains, reorganize companies. We need to do all the many things that's necessary in order to make that happen. We ought to reduce the burdens on companies. We ought to simplify tax systems. We ought to simplify regulatory systems. We need to do all of these things in order to unblock the problems within the real economy that might hold things back because otherwise we're just living off our reserves and those won't last forever. Yeah, a few days ago, um, Van der Leyen was, uh, I believe she was giving an interview and she said that uh, the Russian economy is on the verge of bankruptcy. And I'm, I'm very curious as to what do you think the EU and the US's term, its definition of bankruptcy means for Russia? Because I'm thinking they're going to spin this default that they're yeah. trying to orchestrate yeah. for Russia. They're going to spin it into a declaration of bankruptcy, which will yeah. then give them some sort of PR media win. In other words, see, we, we did it. We, bankrupt, we bankrupted Russia. But that's not really the case, is it? So... I'm starting. I'm listening to what Vanderlei and Biden has said this as well in, in in various interviews and statements, and it seems like they're trying to gaslight people into believing that Russia is going to be bankrupt. But technically, that is not the situation. I mean, my point is Russia is not sitting with zero money in the bank, and they're going to need to figure out a, a way to get a loan. Which is to me, that's bankrupt. I have no money. I got to get a loan. I'm done. But that's not the case. Well, they're not bankrupt at all. They're, as I said, they're actually awash with cash. They have more than they know what to do with at the moment. That's, in fact, that's a kind of problem for them. But what van der Leyen is saying is that, you know, because the Russians are paying their debts, their foreign debts in rubles, that's going to mean that that's going to enable the American credit agencies to say that Russia is in default. And that's what she means by bankruptcy. She means default. You but mean course, Standard and Poor's and, and Standard Fitch? Standard and Poor and Moody's you, you these, and Fitch okay. and all of these. That's exactly what she means. Right, right. And, of course, you're absolutely right. This is an induced default because, of course, if there hadn't been the sanctions, if those central banks' reserves hadn't been seized, then, of course, that problem wouldn't arise. Now, I'm afraid it's, I think, rather more sinister than you're saying because, of course, what they're then going to do is they're going to justify that default, which they will call a default. They're going to use that default, that bankruptcy, as they say, as an excuse to seize Russian state assets, those $300 billion of reserves that the Russian Central Bank has, but also, of course, any other assets that the Russian government or the Russian state has anywhere else in the West. Now, of course, all of those assets, in theory, are covered by sovereign immunity. But as we've seen, West no longer shows any 
respect for sovereign immunity when it applies to countries like Russia, which it has sanctioned. So we're going to see over the next couple of months a mass seizure of Russian assets. So that's something, you know, we, we need to bear in mind, and that's, and that's coming. I mean, this is a pirate raid, if you like, but it's on the way. Now, I will say Nabolina has made it very clear that she's looking now for legal redress. She's mobilizing some kind of attempt to try to bring legal cases to stop this. I think she's going to find that it's going to be very difficult in the West to get Western law firms to act for the Russian Central Bank in this case. I mean, how, does, how do they get paid for one thing? And besides, they will come under enormous pressure from Western governments not to act for the Russian Central Bank. And of course, even if they do, the chances of Western courts, you know, following the law, if you like, and going against what Western governments are doing is, I would have thought, slight, and I'm being I'm understating things. So I think that's what's going to happen. I think, as I said, we're going to see a mass seizure of Russian assets. I don't think this is any kind of... I don't think this would have been considered a default once upon a time because, as I said, it's an induced default. And what kind of a default is that? But that doesn't mean that that seizure of assets isn't going to happen. Whatever theoretical legal concerns there might be about it. Right. I mean, the Russians can pay the debt. They have the money to pay whatever they owe, but um, they won't accept the rubles. And uh, obviously, they, the, the Russians don't have the, the ability to pay in foreign currencies either. So it's going to be an induced default. Um, this, is like the, this is like the bank robbery of the, the greatest bank robbery in history, the, the greatest yeah, theft in all of history. And, and, and we're starting to understand why it's so important for the collective West to keep the escalation going. Not only is the military industrial complex making money, not only are the stockholders in government who are, in co who are cooperating with the MIC making money, but my God, 300 billion and then some more in assets. I mean, so many people are gonna become so fabulously wealthy from all of this uh, theft. But switching gears to Europe and the US, their economy is going to um, is not going to forgive this break in trust. Their financial architecture is not going to forgive this break in trust, because that's what this is going to do. It's going to break a lot of the trust that many investors and many countries and businesses once upon a time had in the uh, financial architecture of the collective West, and that leads us to um, the difficulties that lie ahead for Europe and the United States. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to just make one quick point, of course. If you start seizing assets, Russian state assets, then, of course, one thing you may have find that you have to do with them is that you might find that the creditors, Russia's creditors, start making their demands against you. So you might be able to stop the Russians bringing court cases. It doesn't mean that Russia's creditors might not bring court cases. So, I mean, that, that you know, it might not be quite as straightforward and, as Ursula von der Leyen and Jake Sullivan and company think. Because, of course, if you hold Russian bonds and you can't get paid, well, you know, you ultimately, your best recourse, presumably, is to go against the Western banks, J.P. Morgan and the rest, and the U.S. government that is preventing you getting paid. And I, you know, I'm sure that there are people in Washington and in New York and in London, bondholders and institutions, that are busy getting legal advice about this. So it might not be quite as straightforward as they think, but you're absolutely right. It is the biggest heist. What we're looking at is the biggest heist in human history. There's nothing ever happened which is, comes close to the scale of what we're going to see. I mean, I mean, nothing has ever happened like this before. And of course, when the dust settles, everybody around the world is going to see this. The Chinese will be the first to see it. They'll be saying to themselves, all those th the reports we had years ago, that, you know, um, if we tried to pull out of treasuries, 
the treasury, the U.S. Treasury would stop us doing so. It would freeze our, our you know, our, our 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 treasury bonds to prevent us, you know, selling them. You know, the Chinese will start to say to themselves, you know, is it really a good idea to buy treasury bonds, U.S. Treasury bonds? Is it really a good idea to invest in Western economies? And of course, that's the Chinese. Others will do the same. India is already talking about it. And we talked in previous programmes about how India now finds itself on the first rung of the sanctions escalator. So this is a disaster. More and more people, by the way, are saying this. You go to all the sort of financial journals, if you go to Zero Hedge, you see more and more people talking about the way in which this thing has been done. It's been done by people who think they're clever, but who are not, and who do not understand that if trust is abused in this way, especially, you know, matters of money, when, you know, trust in money matters, as we know, is the whole basis of the financial architecture, of successful financial architecture and financial engineering. Once trust goes, it can never be brought back because everybody, everybody will know what has, who has ultimately behind the crisis in the financial system, the global financial system that we are now seeing. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, final comments with regards to uh, the EU economy, maybe some member oh, yeah. states in the EU and how their yeah. economy is doing or the US economy to wrap up the They're video? Doing, right, right. You see, this is it. I know, I, I, I'm going to make a suggestion. I think that, you know, the, the Russians are having all these internal debates. You see people want to spend more money. You see Nabulina saying, look, hold on, we can't do it quite in the way that you do. But, you know, eventually I predict that the Russians will come to some kind of understanding with each other and they'll find a way forward. They've got that kind of background. That's their history. And, of course, they've got the resources to pull them through. And um, so, you know, there's different estimates about how long it will take. The Prime Minister Mishutsin said six months to a year. Nabulina, I think, is probably looking at 2024. And so is Alexei Kudrin, who was the finance minister, the supposedly pro-Western finance minister in the early 2000s. I think, personally, I'm with Nabulina and Kudrin on this. I, I think it to turn a ship of this scale round is going to take some time. And 2024 is probably more optimistic than... More, more realistic, sorry, than six months to a year. But anyway, so they will, but they will get there. In the West, we are still, it seems to me, in that state of economic intoxication where we sanction and sanction and pile on more sanctions. We've sanctioned coal, even though Germany's biggest, the biggest producer of electricity in Germany is not gas, it's not oil, it's not nuclear power, it's coal. And where does Germany import most of that coal from? It imports it from Russia. And there aren't actually that many alternative options. And Germany doesn't actually mine coal, uh, uh, you know, bl black coal, anthracite and all that. It doesn't mine it itself. It does still use lignite from East Germany, but even that they want to phase out. So we, we've done it that with coal. We're very soon going to do that with oil. We're going to do that with gas eventually as well, all in impossibly short timetables. Inflation pretty much everywhere, I'm pretty sure, in the West is now in double figures. And I'm now reading all over the place in almost every financial journal that I'm seeing that, you know, we are going to be in, we are going to be in an economic recession by the summer. I suspect we probably already are, actually. But the extraordinary thing is, this isn't slowing us down. Because whilst the Russians are obliged, I mean, you know, the situation is compelling them to look for solutions to their economic problems. All our focus at the moment in the West is on what more sanctions we can impose, even though imposing those sanctions is going to make our own life harder. You made that extremely good point in one of our programmes that we did. I think it was on our live stream yesterday that um, there is this 
hope in the West that if we throw enough sanctions at the Russians, we'll break them by the autumn and everything will be right, go right by then. Well, what if we don't? Do we have a plan B? No sign of anybody preparing for it. Well, I think that was uh, taken from um, Ursula van der Leyen's uh, interview or, or speech where uh, she was hinting at the fact that that is kind of the, the EU kleptocrat plan is we're, we're going to throw everything at them and they will break by autumn and then, you know, we'll, we'll be able to, to, to get all the energy at really rock bottom prices and everything will be okay. So we just have to suffer until the autumn. But do you think that's a realistic plan? No, I don't I think mean, it's a real- is, I, I, do, I don't think it's realistic. I, I think it is completely unrealistic. I think it is in, entirely and profoundly wrong. Remember the, the shock and awe financial sanctions that they imposed in February were expected to achieve certain results, and they achieved the opposite. So why think that any more of these sanctions, which are incredibly ill thought through as well, I mean, they're not based on, uh, you know, proper assessments of how the Russian economy works, because I don't think they know very much about how the Russian economy works. So I don't think that they're looking at that. I think what they're looking at is a fantasy Russia, which is entirely of their own imagination. I mean, I don't think they understand what they're, what they're doing. And of course, you know, it's a massive gamble. <laughs> it's an incredibly dangerous gamble, because if the autumn comes and Russia is still standing, and who knows, perhaps even recovery, or starting to show signs of recovery, and we are locked in endless recession and inflation and stagflation issues. Well, what do we do then? Promote Ursula to chairman of the European Central Bank. <laughs> She'll get promoted up. Yeah. <laughs> what we do. She'll get promoted up, yeah. yeah. Promote her up. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what's going to happen, too. Um, yeah. Real quick, do you think Russia's going to be standing by autumn? Yeah, I think Do you think there will, will be a regime I, I, change by autumn, yeah, I mean, as, think, the EU, as the EU is predicting? I think they will, actually. First of all, I mean, there is no conceivable way that you can stop... Uh, um, all Russian or oil and gas exports. I mean, that's impossible. I mean, uh, I, you know, you might conceivably may manage it um, in Europe, but you can't really block it indefinitely around the whole of the rest of the world. It just won't happen. But anyway, I mean, I think that this is based on a misunderstanding. An economy, the Russian economy, most of what it does, it does domestically. And yes, it's going to have a lot of problems adjusting, but adjust eventually it will. Most countries don't export oil or gas, and then they still manage to keep their economies going. Russia certainly can. It's got the industrial and the industrial resources, the technological skills, the governance systems to be able to do that. I'm sure it will be there by the autumn, just as I was sure when the financial shock and all sanctions were imposed in February. I mean, you know, you can go back, reel back and watch our programmes at that time, uh, uh, that it would not achieve the regime change outcome that Western governments expected. All right, we will leave it there. Everybody who is watching from Rumble, click on that red maroon button. That will take you to our Locals community page at durant.locals.com and go to the Durant shop Use the code good day, get 10% off all merchandise. There's the mug. That is the code as well. 10% off. Take care.